date on call to order at 6.01 p.m. Uh, welcome to everybody. It's nice to be in person. Hopefully we'll do a little bit more of this in the coming months. Um, so we are going to take attendance. Um, we have, I'm just going to read it since Sarah's not here, but let's turn it Okay, great. Darren Rose. Evan, teach me how to say your last name, please. Presbrowski. Presbrowski. Yep, Evan. Awesome, great. Jim Carter. Greg Pios. Dwayne Stanley. Bella Gorman. Scott Mobley. And myself. <laughs> yeah, was it okay? Was it that? It's okay. It's easy pronunciation. I appreciate it. Um, all right, next up on the agenda is public comment. Do we have anybody for public comment tonight? Okay. Excellent. All right, consent agenda items. Um, we had two items that were added today for review. Um, they are the construction budget information sheets. There should be two documents. Anybody have any questions on those? Any points for discussion? Nothing to be said to us? They were in board on track, but they were a late addition to board on track. But they're in there now if you want to take a look. Right, there are no two financials, which is in the agenda, not the recent, there's an updated agenda on board on track as well, just not the printed out version. Um, Liana, anything to call out or is it good to stay? No worries. Awesome. Um, if you review and have any questions before the end of the meeting, we can bring it up and share business. All right. Um, the only vote we have tonight is approved. This is very quick tonight, guys. <laughs> um, the only vote we have tonight is the approval of the Board of Trustees meeting minutes from August 29th, 2024. Do we have any questions about the agenda? Any? I mean, sorry, the minutes, the edits? Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. I'll second. Thank you. Um, roll call vote for agenda items. We'll just do it just to be formal. Um, so, Darren? Yes. Yes. Evan? Yes. Yes. I'm going to abstain. Yes. Yes. For me. Great. So. Moving on to updates. Marcy, fundraising update. Do you want me to go here? Uh, yes, because it's being recorded. Please, thank you. <laughs> I will face the hallway. <laughs> if you want, you can grab a mic. You just want to sit here and grab a microphone? No, it's fine. I just, this is fine. I don't have much to say. Yeah, yeah we got extra seats if you want to just come and join the circle. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sure, you can sit down with them. I just didn't want to stand there. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we had our inaugural Running with the Eagles event on September 14th. Uh, we had about 65 participants, which was great for the first time out. Um, made a little money. We were thinking maybe we were going to break even, so that's good news. The Lower School Fun Run is on October 30th, and we are anticipating hopefully similar success to last year. It raised around $20,000. Um, so we have a meeting tomorrow to continue to work on that. The bourbon raffle is still running. We have um, like 75-ish, I think, tickets sold, and um, we're still publicizing it. We had a STEM Southern Eagles board meeting last night. We publicized it to that group. We are starting to loosely form the Anniversary Planning Committee. We sent a notice out to the staff today and to the parent community asking for volunteers who want to participate on that. Um, we, I was very happy to have three responses within 10 minutes, which was really exciting. So that's good news. Um, and I am thinking that we will um, hopefully have a representative from this group maybe or, you know, come, you know, Maybe Evan, I don't, I'm not sure because if this group is, the anniversary committee is going to be reporting to the Be development committee. We can talk about that at our development committee meeting. Um, but we also talked to the Stensor and Eagles board last night about having a representative from that committee or from that board to be on this committee too. And um, again, I have a 
pretty deep list of ideas for that, but I certainly am not the whole decision maker on what we're going to do. So we're really looking for a lot of feedback from people on all of, all of the things that we can do throughout a year. So we span two school years for this anniversary, which is really nice opportunity. And we also talked about ways to get the kids engaged too today. Um, so I think that should be good. What, when's the kickoff date of the? So we think we're going to do the kickoff when the, we do the um, ribbon cutting for the new building. Oh, cool. Um, sort of roll it all into one big January event. We were talking January before we knew when the Transformer was coming, and now that we know that the Transformer is here-ish. Um, Did it get dropped off? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, Tomorrow. right. So uh, January, January, I think, is, is realistic again, because when we were thinking we would have to move that to March or April or May, we were thinking. So the, the theory that I have going right now is that we will do something every month of the year, 2025, probably not July, but we'll have something going on. Not some huge thing, but something ceremonial, you know, tree planting or a mural, or a, we've talked about having an event in each of the core towns to bring the community together, uh, all sorts of things. So that's exciting for us. The business partners program is still going really well. Um, Mary Jo Naraki and Cindy Zomar, who are the two main volunteers who are working on that, made presentations at both of the back to school nights this week and last week, which um, they actually got a little more traction with the lower school back to school night. Um, I think some of the parents were hearing the fundraising information for the first time. And so we've had a couple of parents reach out to us with referral names, which is really, really gratifying. And so we're following up on those. We actually had a meeting with a local business this week. And um, Mary Jo came to the STEM Sorting Eagles committee meeting last night to make a presentation too. So that is still going very well. Um, we've decided to apply for Mass Cultural Council money this year for a couple of programs that we have budget relieving. Um, we're doing the one that you can apply through each town. So I think we're actually going to throw in an application for each of our four towns. It's not much money at all. They run $350 to $750. But um, there's a lot of really good press that comes along with getting a grant like that. So um, that's, those are due mid-October. So that's one of the things that we're focused on. The bricks were delivered. I feel like maybe around September 8th or something. So all the bricks are here. Um, we're talking a little bit more about what the layout might look like. Do we need to actually order something a little more ceremonial that says AMSA's name for the middle of them? We're working out, out all those things. The plan right now, I think, is to install the bricks in November, but Eric has explained several times that the way they will be installed, we will have flexibility to add or shift, um, which is nice because more when we talked about this last month, you actually asked if there might be opportunity to add, and there will be. Awesome. Um, so that's good news. Great. And um, we did send out a fundraising letter to the whole school community um, maybe two weeks ago, um, just sort of highlighting all of the ways that people can participate. You can volunteer, you can make a referral, you can make an outright gift, you can um, join a committee, all of these other things. And so we will continue to touch base with our community in various ways throughout the year. Again, um, I believe that I'm going to make some sort of presentation maybe next month or the month after that is the overall development plan for the whole year, but need to talk it through with the development committee first. And we have a meeting loosely on the books right now for October 16th, I think, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we'll work it out in that group and then we'll come here. And you'll see that the calendar sort of has a couple of development touch points throughout the entire year spread out. You know, there's the Giving Tuesday, which is a certain date that we need to follow, but then we have flexibility to shift things around and, you know, touching the various populations at different times. So, any questions? That's all. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Marcy. You're welcome. Next is the parent representative update. Yep. Yeah, so. <coughs> Good start to the year. It seems like for every board meeting, there's at least one email that comes into my email, which is great. Um, so that means that folks know that the email is active and, and people are reaching out when they want to. So um, so this email is about um, eligibility for the free, month, free lunch program that all Mar Marlboro schools and um, other schools are eligible for, for. And they were asking about, because we have a new building, will there be kitchen space in the new building? And will that address, you know, will that be able to address the free lunch program with like the kitchen and all that kind of stuff? So 
that was a question uh, from a parent. Um, so any thoughts? So just a factual information, there is no kitchen in the new building. Um, it takes a lot more than that to become eligible for the federal lunch program. It is a very restrictive program when it comes to dietary satisfaction for kids. Um, we have looked into whether or not the, our provider can meet those restrictions and it would be very, very challenging. Um, the other thing that being part of the federal pro program would do, it would be, it would eliminate any type of food fundraising that the kids do, such as bake sales um, for their clubs, because you cannot do those when you're part of the federal lunch program. Uh, so unfortunately, because we don't have much control over the food that um, the kids buy. We have control, but we don't have that restricted control. I mean, they count fat, they count carbs. Everything is wheat-based. Uh, so that's not how we do it here at AMS because we don't have our own kitchen. And um, unless we had our own kitchen ability to serve all the students, which is not eligible. Thank you. Yeah. What I'll do is I'll, I'll connect you with this okay. for follow up. Just to and if they up. want a phone, phone call with me, you just let them know, no problem. Okay. Yep. Um, and that was it. Um, reached out to the PTO. No, no major updates on that front. So that's what I have for today. Okay. I think they had their uniform sale the same day as 5K. Yeah. So. Excellent. All right. Any questions for Dwayne? Great, thank you, Dwayne. Uh, next is the faculty representative update, Greg. So things are running smoothly. I've gotten uh, a decent number of responses, including what I believe is my first ever positive response to one of my feedback surveys. Usually it's just a bucket of complaints, but I actually got a positive one, so take that as a good sign, um, I suppose. Um, September is kind of a month where things just sort of churn along. The, the schedule seems to be working okay. I, I think people are pretty settled in, and it, I think I said this last meeting, but it's definitely going smoother than it did last year with sort of new software, like PowerSchool, et cetera. So uh, on that front, things seem to be good. Uh, one specific thing that I have been hearing is people have been interested in sort of fundraising opportunities for the new building. Um, I have teachers asking about like, oh, could we do a gala, could we have um, students serve food, et cetera, and I, I had a meeting with Lisa today where we talked about this, it's good to hear that people want to get um, involved. So I definitely think, I think that was a lot of information, Marcy, from fundraising, so I'm going to try and transmit that to the staff as best I can, because they definitely seem to be interested in it. Absolutely, and if they want to join the anniversary planning committee, <laughs> they should feel free to reply to that email also. That's pretty much all the news I've got, so. That's fabulous. Can I can I ask what the positive I, I can quote is? it to you. It's not very um, it's not very specific, but hold on. I have the survey results up right now. If I could actually find it, hold on. The computer is refusing. Quote, I think the start of the year has been pretty smooth. Students seem to have generally settled in well. <laughs> awesome. Sounds great. Okay, that, that's about as positive as I've ever gotten. So. <laughs> you know, I think we have to dig into the not so positive, and I think we should dig into the positive too. So I'm glad it's been a good start to speak. That's awesome. Any questions for Greg? Awesome. Okay, moving right along. Dr. Mowley. Let's see. So, just for tonight, uh, I'm going to do an overview of a few things because it was timely for September. I'm going to talk a little bit about AMSA and college missions. We're going to do a quick SAT score review. And then on September, um, we're supposed to review the strategic plan. Again, broad balcony view. And then some housekeeping updates. All right, so let's talk data. This was uh, an interesting data dive. Um, again, what I was trying to do is figure out if, in fact, 
students from AMSA were not doing as well being accepted to the top 30 schools. Um, and again, they, so they just changed today uh, after I did this. But I, I dug deep into some IVs. And at first glance, I can understand why parents are asking this question. Because if you look straight at this so slide, it does look like the percentages of kids accepted to these different universities and colleges were better in the cohort of 2011 to 17 than they are in 2018 to 24. But again, that's just looking at it with this straight view and nothing else. So taking a little bit of a deeper dive into AMSA's acceptance rates, this shows you the, um, the class, all the applications that went out, the number of acceptances, and the percent accepted. And then it divides it uh, from all applications to just the IV applications. So one thing that was important in the previous slide um, that I just didn't mention was that um, in 2022, 26 students applied to Brown that year, but only two met the qualifying GPA and standardized test scores. One of them applied early decision, and one of them applied regular decision, and the e early decision individual was accepted. So, I think what we saw, what I saw a lot in 2022 and 2023 was a lot of what I like to call spaghetti against the wall. So it was the COVID years, COVID recovery years, let's say, and students were applying to just see if they could get in. So we had a lot of rejections in those two years. Those numbers are very skewed, but on average, AMSA kids, you can see in 2011, they get into 63% of the colleges and universities that they apply to, and in 2024, it's only down slightly, 52%. You can see where 63 was kind of a high as well. Uh, since the class of 2017, IV acceptance rates have held pretty steady, with the exception, like I said, of um, 23 and 24, uh, 22 and 23. You can also see that as the number of applications submitted by students kind of increase, the acceptance rate kind of generally decreases. We can talk a little bit about that. Why? In the coming slides. Students who are accepted to the top tier schools are more likely accepted if they are applying early decision or early action. Remember, early decision is a binding decision. It's a contract you make with the college, and that is sealed if they accept you. Early action, you, have, you continue to have flexibility. So what are some things happening at the college and university level? Well, admission slots are declining and application rates are increasing. And again, diving into Naviance and the kids who apply, uh, students have been denied admission most likely because their standardized test scores and their GPAs have been below the accepted averages. Do we know at the schools where tests are optional, whether or not our students are submitting the optional tests and it's, how that compares to the... No, I'm talking more, um, so you can only, we could only maybe figure that out if we looked only at these last couple of years because prior to COVID, it was not test optional. And the interesting piece, uh, I've been on webinars 
over the past two weeks with um, Harvard, uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Wellesley, University of Virginia, Duke, and then we had Georgia Tech, Purdue, Harvey Mudd, and Olin here. Um, many of the schools, and last year I presented SAT saying, do they really matter? If you remember that presentation, there, most schools, if not this year, next year will be going back to asking for the test. The test will no longer be test optional. In the conversations with the admissions counselors, however, if it is a test optional school, unless you have near perfect boards, do not send out. That was the message that I got from sitting in all those webinars. I guess the music's going to stop. Mm -hmm. So taking a look at our kids now and then, because we're still trying to figure out some of the why behind this, um, really you can see that the, the GPA has kind of remained steady. The, and this is the average GPA. The percent of acceptance kind of remains steady. But you can see in 2022 and 2023, clearly the number of apps per students is way up there. Colleges are tracking everything kids do. Whether they follow them on social media, how many likes their university gets, everything that kids are doing. What the colleges accept. So basically these are the SAT averages the minimum app, the minimum SAT, ACT, GPA, and then the percentage of acceptance are our kids to the right. What's really, really impressive is if you start looking at tier one research schools, the percentage of our students getting into tier one research schools surpasses their average acceptance rates at many of these universities. And I think that that's something to consider before making some sort of blanket statement that AMS is not getting kids into the same schools that they used to. Because one of the questions is, are, really, are our kids applying to the same schools that they used to apply? And the answer is no. The, the schools that AMSA students are applying to has broadened greatly since 2011. And again, they're focusing on these research schools and universities. Yield protection. So before starting this deep dive, I didn't know what this was. The yield protection. Yield is the percentage of students accepted to the college who actually attend. College benefits directly from having a high yield rate, and colleges care a lot about their relative place in the rankings. And yield is one of the many factors used to calculate them. So while they increase their yield rate, colleges have a chance to directly impact their place in the rankings. And on today's call with Harvard, they specifically emphasized that their yield percentage was up at 84% this year over last year. Um, in many cases, students are rejected just to uh, protect the yield. Uh, interesting conversation with an admissions counselor from Georgia Tech when they were here, who wanted us to know that had the application of our valedictorian risen to her level, it probably would have been an acceptance, but the student applied regular decision and Georgia Tech figured that that student had, or had applied to Georgia Tech as a backup and was denied because they figured it was a backup. I'm sure it was. This individual is at an Ivy and doing really well. So I don't think there's any tears there, but it's still kind of yucky. It's kind of yucky. It's worse than that. I mean, the industry is brutal. It, I can tell you from the college side yeah. that it's not just but we think we're their backup. It extends to, like, if Danny went to Cornell, don't let Harvard know on your Harvard application. Yeah, yeah. And Harvard's not my client, by the way. I'm just not giving it up as a, <laughs> just as an example, but they care so much about people saying yes 
when the school says yes, that if they have any kind of inkling that you'll say no if you're accepted, you can move down the list. Right. And, and, and it's, it's trickling down to schools like UMass. Like we used to, you know, as a former guidance counselor, I used to, you know, counsel my kids to have UMass as a backup. And UMass knows when you have it as a backup. And um, there, there are AMSA students who are, who are rejected from UMass because their profile is too good in UMass because they'll go someplace else. Um, so, we'll, we'll talk about some things to try to combat that. Um, so my conclusions, here we go. Um, acceptance rates really have remained steady with our students being accepted to on average 55% of the schools that they apply to. Students are applying to more uh, further reach schools than ever before. AMSA students are applying to tier one research universities over schools ranked just in the top 30. What matters to students has changed over the years. And there appears to really be no link between rigor or lack thereof in the current admission percentages. AMSA still offers beyond college level courses and our students continue to perform well. Conversation with parent after parent who has had an AMSA graduate, they tell me that year one is a breeze for their child. Uh, AMSA really is a public school offering a private school education. So just a few stats that aren't up there. Um, 49 students from the class of 2024 are attending a tier one research university. Uh, and there was 127 students there. Students are also, in, and I had an interesting conversation with um, the director of guidance who was extremely helpful and I will give her a big thanks at the end of this for this. Uh, students are choosing other things. So when you look at our school profile this year, you're gonna look at the percentage of students going on to four-year colleges and it's going to look low. I wanna say it's 80 something percent and in the low 80 something percent. We had several students, so we had two students go to trade school, six students last year decided to take a gap year. So they probably got into where they wanted to go, they may have deferred, but they're taking a gap year. Four went on for employment, one to the military, and two undecided. Um, 103 students pursuing a bachelor's degree and nine in associate's degree. So even though that percent attending four-year college looks lower than before, it's intentional. The kids have made you know, decisions and good decisions at that. All right, this is the important slide. Increasing your odds of acceptance. Apply early. If you don't want to apply early decision because you don't want that binding decision, make sure you just apply early action. Demonstrate your interest. Visit the school, make sure you know, make sure they know you did, reach out to the admissions counselor, sign up for you know, virtual tours with your emails, um, like them on social media. Make sure your social media can, uh, name identifies you a little bit and it's not just like Pokemon 3 and they have no idea who that is. Um, individualize your essays. Don't blanket your essay. If it's some place that you really want to go, study the website, find some quality that that college or university has that is important to you and that you've demonstrated that quality in things you do. Whether it's your research here at AMSA or your job after school or your caretaking of another adult, make sure your essay demonstrates fit and interest. Those were the buzzwords that we heard from all of the admissions counselors over the past few weeks. Um, it was interesting, they talked a little bit about early college, and quite frankly, they would rather, the top tier colleges would rather see students optimize the opportunities that AMSA provides you rather than an early college course, which are typically online and you're taking at another outside college. They stated they can't prove the curriculum, whereas your school has a proven curriculum. Um, participate in activities. Yes, it's important, 
but only if it's meaningful to you and be able to tell your why. Why are you part of UNICEF? Why are you part of speech and debate or challenge, challenge success? Um, a common question is what qualities and strengths do you bring to our college and university? Make sure you can answer that with some quality that they're looking for at their college or university. Students need to sell themselves. Also, don't just ask for recommendations from teachers whose class you aced. Ask for recommendations from teachers whose class you struggled in but you were successful in so they can tell that story of perseverance. That's really important to the colleges because they want you to stay as well. All right, questions or other input? Or? I feel like uh, worthwhile on that same note of like do your own research about the universities. Similarly, into in the professional world, if you see a job that you're interested in, you look at the you know the whole description. You're like, okay, cool. Let me take half of these words, spin them around, and throw them back on what they want to see. Absolutely. Same thing kind of works for the students. We're like, what's the mission statement of my school that I really want to go to? What are their core values? So on and so forth. So that's a big one as well. And like the, how do you demonstrate those? Yeah, these are lessons that um, the kids do get in their senior seminar. Um, I definitely want to thank Kate Driver and the guidance department. Um, they also did some data digging. Um, they, they definitely unlocked some doors for me to get into to do this myself. Um, they were very, very helpful. Um, but it's, don't just throw that spaghetti against the wall. So the schools that you profile, do we have data on um, how many, if any, of our students were accepted when the school was chosen not to go? That's a little bit more difficult. So Naviance, Naviance has some reports, but I, I but nothing straightforward like that. I would take it would have to I'd have to take some time, and it's a new report in Naviance. It okay. won't go back to 2011. You know why I'm asking right now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, because if a lot of AMSA students say no thank you to Cornell, Cornell is going to look away from AMSA. I mean, they have the data that the they know. universities have on high schools would make your head spin. I bet. I mean, they have institutional research departments that crunch that data and they could tell you, like, I've got clients, they don't care what GPA you put on your transcript. They recalculate a specific. Uh, they recalculate the GPA specific to the high school to the students that apply. That's great. Yeah. It's, it's big business, you know. I think the other thing that was clear um, from Yale, Harvard, and Princeton was the emphasis on first-generation students, and also the amount of money that they have to provide um, both citizens and non-citizens to meet their 100% need. Um, but they seem to have this desire to get a lot of first-gen students. It's a little nauseating as a parent. I, yes, I, I, I can imagine it would be because I don't think that I stressed about it as much with uh, either one of my children, but I had one that I knew hands down he would get into because basically it was a place nobody was going. Um, it's nauseating as a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. And on the other side, I have one who's now in her second year in college and she did find that first year, with the exception of organic chemistry, um, easy. Yeah. Easier than I think anybody would have anticipated. She definitely struggled a lot less mm -hmm. finding balance. Being able to do it all. So, oh, go ahead. No, please, you go first. And I think sometimes, just from the teacher side of things, it helps to be sort of frank about when our goals as a school for getting kids into good colleges conflict with our goals as a school of sort of being rigorous and teaching well. I, I recall that I've been talking about this to a, a parent of a friend, um, and I, I think it's, as a teacher, my class can be very rigorous, or it can be graded in that sort of tough but fair medium that I think most teachers aspire to, or it can be always helpful to get you into college, but it cannot be all three. You get to pick two, essentially, for any class that you teach. And I think being 
you have to be, as a school, sort of cognizant of that fact. And I, I don't say this to say that, oh, we shouldn't care about this data. I care about this data quite a lot. But I think there are, there are trade-offs here that should be recognized, for sure. Yeah, I, w I would agree. I think that, you know, I think that we can, we can do a little bit, maybe, of a better job highlighting some of the things that we do in our profile. And I'm going to work with uh, Kate Driver on that. I think that research courses that IMSA offer, there's probably a few things that we can do to make them more of a focus and a centerpiece for kids that really do love research and want to research. Um, and then I think, you know, we are working on the articulation agreements to see if, how many colleges we can get to go into an agreement. <coughs> Whereas where if our students have, meet their GPA and their SAT score, that they will accept them. Um, you know, you're not going to get those IDs to get into the, that agreement, as I mentioned, but uh, we have our first one with Assumption College. Um, we've got some feelers out uh, with Mass Maritime. Um, and we're going to just kind of expand that. <coughs> All right. Do you think that like uh, like an elective course here for like starting at freshman year about like what to expect when applying to college and beneficial <coughs> to the students just to get them like to get their mind going about like how what what they're going to face when they get to their junior year and especially into the first half of their senior year, like the things that they need to do. So I can have um, Kate Driver maybe come one night and talk about the developmental guidance program that they do, because <coughs> <coughs> they do freshman class and sophomore classes, and then they do junior meetings that are individual meetings, and then senior seminar to work on more of the essays and things like that. Um, it's a little bit of a challenge because when you do classes like that <coughs> and all the kids take it, but then you've got the kids sitting in that class that know they're military, know they're going to, you know, trade or something like that. It's, it can be a little challenging, but listening to Kate, I think they do a pretty, a pretty good job um, exposing them to that. The kids that I looked at in Naviance, their stuff was filled out pretty um, solidly, like pretty completely, completely was the word I was looking for. Whereas previously where it was, you could look things up, you didn't know. Because the kids, because most of what's in Naviance is self-reported, and that's where it's harder to connect that, because they don't necessarily always write, I said yes to this, or it's, it's getting better because we're holding their feet to the fire um, come when we do all the handing out of the senior robes and stuff like that. It's almost like, did you get your Naviance done? So we're getting better at collecting that data, but um, yeah, yeah, some kind of boot camp. Yeah. Um, I like your idea of freshman year, right? Because it yeah. gives you the opportunity to curate a social media profile over a four-year period. That would be a class in itself, actually. I'm just saying that, you know, if you're worried about what your Facebook looks like at the beginning of your senior year, you're late to worry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, uh, the SAT. So this is going to be interesting in just that, how things differ. So this, I chose to present it this way this year because what I'm going to show you is basically the same, I think, 33 kids that took this test in two different two different times. Now, I'm, there is a practice effect, but this spring, when our students took the SAT, their mean total score was 1278, which is 278 points, well, not 78, 271 points over global testers. And then you can see where we are in the state, all schools in the state, public schools. So 
our kids are performing well on the SATs. This is what's called fall 2024, but this is the test you take in August. And um, it's clearly higher, but as you can see, it's all of it is higher. And that's because that's how they norm the test with who takes them. I've always been told to take the SATs in August, though. Always. My boys did better in August. I've always been told to take the SATs in August. I don't know why. That is shocking. Yeah. But, <laughs> but again, you know, the ANSA students are still outperforming the state and the global testers. So this is just, it's kind of another piece of data that shows me that our rigor and what we're doing with our kids is uh, still strong as ever. This is um, the growth that this cohort has shown from when they took their fall 2021 PSATs through that fall SAT. Again, if we're thinking about AMSA, its curriculum, its professionals, they're doing a great job because we can see that trajectory and see the growth in our kids. This is growth in math. And it kind of tells the same picture. So can you help me understand the data behind this? Let me tell you how I'm interpreting it, because I'm sure that it's wrong, right? So the black dot obviously is the mean score, and I can see that going up over time, and that's what you'd expect, right? right. As you continue to be prepared, you're getting yep. more prepared. But I'm fascinated by the idea that the size of the green bar is shrinking while that's happening. Because, <clears throat> so the size of the green bar is shrinking because less kids are scoring in that area. So how can the, how can the mean be going up? I think it's fewer compared. students are meeting or exceeding expectations. So our kids are the black dots. The, the world is the colored. I gotcha. Okay. Okay, so this isn't all not yeah, correct, 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 correct. Okay. Now, uh, your question is spot on. It makes sense if this was the 33 kids for right. for AMSA. No. So what the heck is happening in the rest of the world? I mean, you would expect that everybody would get more prepared, and the, the good schools would just have a higher trajectory. But, I mean, we should still be upwards slumping, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Well, that may be an overall like the, the comparison might be the whole population and not a slice of kids that are hit in each. Yeah, so the comparison group would be... Well, there's still a fall of 2023 12th graders in the right front column. Yeah. Is that, okay. Yeah. There's the still two the small sections. groups, though, because they've got to be kids that took the PSATs in 21, the PSATs in 22, SATs in 23, and SATs, you know, f I, uh, fall 23. So, oh, explain it. so the, the, the two groups are relatively small. It's not every student, because not every student that took the SAT did take all of those, if that makes sense. So the answer group, I think there's only 33 kids in the group <clears throat> that they could track like that. Any other questions on SAT? How does it compare to, how does it compare to the year before? Interestingly enough, you can't get that. I wanted to do a five-year for you. And the reason you can't get that is because, I think, unlike the AP exam is one a year, kids, like, I, I could compare, I could compare this to last year's fall, the year before's fall and spring. I could get those numbers. But it's not the same kids and... Sometimes they take it twice, sometimes they take it. So it's really like apples and oranges when you try to look for a five-year trend there. Yeah. But the APs will do that. We'll show the five-year trend for APs. Next time I'll do AP and MCAS for you all. Um, so just wanted to quickly take a second, because September says review our strategy. Um, you remember we worked on this in January at our retreat 
and just wanted to go over a basically um, to the right are all our strategic objectives we have objectives in governance teaching and learning faculty and staff development parent and community partnerships development facilities and operation and then when we once we receive the answer to our charter renewal which should be sometime in December we will then work as a community on what we want as the key performance indicators so that is why that's still blank because um, that'll be whole staff we'll be working together to do our new um, annual goal setting and we'll identify those key performance indicators that we will measure ourselves against for the next five years of the charter. Okay. All right, housekeeping. Yes, I thought today was the 27th, but it's actually the 26th, thank God. So main building, transform arrives on the 27th. Ooh, we are celebrating for sure. Um, 20th anniversary, if anyone wants to participate, contact Marcy Echo. We did submit the expansion application to DESE. Um, if AMSA is awarded the expansion, we will apply for additional grant money <clears throat> that is available to support the expansion for like books and materials, training, anything we need. Um, you may start to see pushback. Um, we are one of four charter schools who have applied for expansion this year. And it is because several districts in the state fell into the lowest 10% uh, performance area. But the news articles are starting to come out with the typical um, charters take all of our money. Um, we need to remember that when a student comes to a charter school in the first year, the district is reimbursed 100% for the money that comes over. So it's not a straight, we take the money all the time type of situation. Um, but if you're hearing any of that, you know, you, you can reach out to me and I, I will help you with some language on how to navigate that. Um, college partnerships, as I mentioned, we signed a memorandum understanding with assumption. Not only is it a seven day admission decision for these students, but they are guaranteed the highest amount of merit money that Assumption provides. Um, and there's additional uh, scholarship money that guidance can access for kids in need. Um, this is my interesting housekeeping. So, uh, to remember when it was I was at the lower school open house and parents stopped in to chat with me very concerned about our students <clears throat> our drivers and when our kids are crossing forestry so I, I talked to Eric and Eric let me know that in 2012 uh, state of Massachusetts approved AMSA as a school zone and then had sent us this plan so this is the plan for a school zone and back then my understanding is there was some back and forth between AMSA and the city of Marlboro about who was then going to pay for the signage and I think it kind of just died or no one pursued it or I'm not exactly I don't have that history um, but AMSA really believes that it's our responsibility to construct our campus in a way that is most safe for kids. And we've done so by redoing the entire loop road, getting that one directional traffic. Additionally, we are spending some extra construction money to create a sidewalk on AMSA property that will lead to Forest Street rather than the kids kind of walking in the roadway um, where people pull in to four kicks and, and pull out. So we are spending that money to help, uh, you know, ensure safety for our kids. And we really do believe that it's the responsibility of the city of Marlboro to fulfill this answer school zone plan. Um, reached out to the mayor's office 
uh, sent him this plan and asked him to uh, consider it and be happy to have a conversation. I also emailed our uh, counselor at large um, and other city counselors that are tied to AMSA, such as uh, Trey uh, Chilio and, um, and Mark Vital and again, uh, Mr. Ossinger. And there was one more that I'm going to forget, and I apologize ahead of time to try to help move this conversation forward. So if you're hearing anything around this, you know, please just be advocates for our kids to help us get this signage done. Most of it's solar now. It shouldn't be too much of a big deal. What are you um, talking money was? I, Eric said something like he was a, it was about fifteen thousand dollars back in the day. I assume we also mentioned it to the mayor's transition chair. Yeah, we did. I will. It's duly noted. Is the transition chair? Me. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Done. Look at that. I never worked on something so fast in my life. <laughs> Check that box. Check that box. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> big thanks. Big thanks. Um, so this would really be, you know, just great for our kids, just just to keep them safe. It's it's pretty busy there. And. Any questions on the schools? Oh, okay. That's it. Look at that. So are we, what's the, the, when did you communicate with the mayor's office? Earlier this week. Okay, so it's early. It's early. Yeah. It's early, yeah. I, I think maybe Monday or so, I, I heard back from Mr. Navin. I think duly noted. <laughs> family response. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I said, okay, then. thank you very much. Um, small thing. Yeah. <laughs> very small. <laughs> so big, and yeah, so small. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the work is pretty much done. We just got to get the sign. The sign. Yeah. I think it would also help because the police department has been very concerned with the speed yes. coming to and from AMSA that signage would probably be in their best interest. Yes. And again, we, you know, we're doing things through the construction to help that. Um, we've put in some smaller speed tables around the lower <coughs> side. When we do smock the white building side, they will be larger speed tables there when we finish that area to try to slow things. If I could actually have a quick question. Are there any plans to put a new sign up around what is now the entrance to sort of the school's loop? Because we're in the awkward situation of having our sort of big official sign at the exit, um, which I just talking about it reminded me, I'm pretty sure I've talked to some staff about this. Just are there any plans or? So this, the new sign, yeah, so there's plans for the new sign. Like when you pull into the white building, there's like this little circular fence that looks like it has a hole. Mm -hmm. That's where the sign's going to go. But we need the transformer first. Okay. So um, the sign's been designed. It looks really nice. It's electronic. Um, it, it, it's it's past. It's past it's every game ordinance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a that's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're all good there. Awesome. Any other questions for Dr. Lundy? I, I do want to just one more shout out uh, again to Trey Fuchilio, former AMSA alum, because he did write a letter of support for AMSA's expansion, which was probably brave to do. So, um, but he values AMSA's education that he had, and I, I, I want to recognize him and thank him for that. Excellent. Yes, thank you, Trey. As brave is probably an understatement. So yeah. <laughs> He will, I'm sure, get a lot of email. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so chair business. I want us to talk about two things and open it up for discussion tonight. Um, cultivation of prospective board members, because there are only nine of us, and um, board engagement uh, in school activities. And I know I sent an email out about that. Um, and Bella, actually, I think is probably the who we can thank for the, <laughs> the idea. Um, but we talk a lot about our involvement in school activities and you know how we can be more visible as a board. 
right? We want the teachers and faculty and staff to know who we are and that we're accessible and that we're friendly and engaged and here to talk to. Um, and the way to really do that is to be a part of what's happening at the school that we all sit on the Board of Trustees for. Um, and at the same time acknowledging that everyone has a job and lives and kids and, and all of these things that sort of fill our schedule. Um, so Bella created a spreadsheet for us to keep track of what school events are coming up, what are good opportunities for us to be present on campus or off campus if it's a different event. Um, and so we're going to do our best to keep that updated and I'm going to put it into Board on Track. We're going to find a place for it and I'll let everybody know where it will live once it's there. Um, but just to sort of you know set a goal for having two board members at these events, right? We're going to have a faculty holiday gathering and open house nights and, and all that kind of thing. So if anybody has any questions, suggestions, ways we can make it easier. Yes. No questions, but I have a sincere suggestion. Yes. Respecting your time, Bella creating another sheet, another Excel sheet might not, like it takes time for her to update it. Why don't you guys get access to the AMSA events calendar that can go directly connect to the Google calendar because it, the, our, our team, like you know, Amanda has been fantastic in setting all of those up. And like that, you guys can just subscribe for it and then everything is up there, the AMSA events calendar. Yeah, well, Instead of somebody else trying to manage that and cause more work for her, for Bella. Well, what we did was we put columns so that we can sign up. Oh, yeah. But, Sorry, wrong, no, wrong no, idea. No. But what would be awesome, and to I, access to that we can get to that. get at, can, can we sync it? So can we make some technology yeah, we, magic? We yeah, we've got some techies. Yeah, um, like that would be awesome. We, we, have, we, have, we, have, we, have <laughs> we could just feed the information yeah. into it, then we can put our names like who's going to go. Well, it's, I mean, uh, I will talk to I will talk to my team members, and I'll get back to you on awesome. this one. Cool. That is possible or not. Like, if we can get yeah. a subscription yeah. calendar, then yeah. yeah, we can make it happen. Yeah. You've assigned me homework, to be clear. And thank you. <laughs> I, would, I would offer, but that is way beyond my scope of capabilities. Um, if I could make a recommendation yeah. as well um, for board presence at these events, I think it would be helpful to have, like, I don't want to say a tent, but like some indication that, like, yes. These are board members because, especially if it's at like one of the faculty lunches, mm -hmm. um, more you can attest to this because you were at one of the last ones. Not everyone knows what people on this board look like, and so everyone's just kind of like sitting with their work friends. And I think the assumption might be, oh, I didn't know they worked here, and then not sitting with you. So like having <laughs> having some indication that like this is who I am. Please talk to me. Sarah, really be Sarah, no, Sarah Snow has boarded everyone. Yes, name nice name tags. Like magnetic ones, so they don't. Oh, so, so they don't ruin my sport So they don't ruin your sport That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so this is. I mean, I think this is really good. I know I've mentioned before that one of the things I would like to sort of do is create more of that warm, fuzzy interaction between us and the rest of the school community. So, um, I appreciate everyone's patience and eagerness to be at different events. Um, second thing. Any other questions on that? In particular, I, I guess I just want to add. There's a bunch of events this month. Yeah. So <laughs> take a look at the list and sign up. <laughs> yes. Until it's on board on track, everybody has the Google link. Yeah. yeah. So it is mutually accessible. Um, next topic is cultivation of prospective board members. So we talk about this a lot. We talk about recruiting new board members often. Um, and I don't feel like we could have a process that is official, potentially buried in the bylaws, but I don't think we've ever been, at least in my tenure, there hasn't, there doesn't seem to have been a um, consistent process that has always been followed. And I think it is time for us to do that. Also as part of our sort of strategic planning as a board, we want to make sure that we live on <laughs> and, and we're not just sort of, we don't get to the point where we're like, do you have a pulse and you're breathing? Great. Hop off, right? That's not, that doesn't cut it for the board. And, um, but I also know that we know a lot of really good, quality, excited people who would be more than willing to serve the AMSA community in this capacity. Um, we don't have any huge building, you know, things to debate until midnight coming up that I'm aware of, so it's a little bit easier of an ask. Um, 
But I do think that for consistency's sake, I think typically they go through governance, and I'm looking at you, Darren, to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so the process kind of goes through governance, and we encourage board members to meet with prospective candidates, ask questions, get to know them, so that there's sort of, it's not really a formal interview process necessarily, but really just an informal getting to know everyone. So that's sort of where we're at now. I want to open it up to discussion to see if folks have other experiences that outline better practices, people have ideas, thoughts, etc. I, I have, I, I guess I'm really opinionated about this, but I had no idea that there were four subcommittees of the board until I joined the board. And you don't have to be a board of trustee member to be on those subcommittees. And that's how Jim started. Jim was on our finance committee. He wasn't on the board of trustees. And, and I think that's great because it's, it's like a succession planning idea, I guess. And it gets um, folks kind of more informed and educated about the school. And then, you know, if they're interested um, and, you know, want to be a trustee, we already have worked with this person for at least a year or more. So I, I really like the idea of um, finding more committee members and then building some sort of succession plan. I totally support that idea. And then also, it's a well. You spoke to the pipeline advantages, but it's also a good vetting vehicle, right? Because if somebody raises their hand and says, "I want to be on the whatever development committee," and then they never show up to participate in the development committee, why would you think that they all of a sudden they're going to want to be a part, you know, a vibrant part of a larger, you know, read it? So. Yeah. I think that's great. Other thoughts, suggestions? When we have a board vacancy, do we sort of put an ad in the paper, so to speak? Is that a thing we should look into? I mean, I'm sure the concern might be that we get a lot of people who are just kind of randos, for lack of a better word. <laughs> but <laughs> would a bunch of randos be better than no one? No. No. Uh, yeah. no. no. Really? I, yeah. So the short answer is we always have board vacancies, right? Because there's not a fixed number of spots. There is a target, though, if I'm not mistaken. I hear you on the target. Um, but it's not like there's, you know, um, it's not like the Supreme Court, you know, when you got nine seats. And you're, you know, if you got a vacancy, you're trying to fill the ninth seat. So we've got minimums and maximums. Um, and so I, I, I think generally it's a, it's a best practice um, to not be at your maximum. Um, I serve on the university board, and we call that the Bill Gates rule. Like, we have 39 authorized spots, and we never want to be at 39 and have to amend the bylaws for when Bill Gates shows up and says he wants to be a board member. <laughs> right? <laughs> so you could genericize that to the billionaire seat, you know. Um, and then after that, you know, the, the we're looking to fill the vacancies with people that we recruit and develop and vet over a period of time. So it's not so much like come apply. Um, although we did identify, I think, to the community when we had needs on certain committees and asked people to raise their hand. And that's, and that's how I got to know folks and joined the development committee. And that's all worked out great. Um, but I mean, the general position, hopefully, we're not in a spot where we're like, oh my god, we've got to fill a seat and we haven't done our, our homework over the last three years to put people on committees or get them all involved in other ways or with the foundation or whatever and kind of build them up to the point where we should have a pipeline where we're like, okay, we're ready to, this person's ready, we're ready, we have a seat available, you know, um, we have a need for a particular skill set and now we can tap into that skill set. Um, yeah, anyway, that's my opinion. Yeah. Is there a, sorry, Bella, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I mean, what you were ju you just said there like a, about a need for a certain skill set like i think we need to talk about or put a what our needs are a list of like what do we need on this board what kind of skills do we need on the board um and i think that would be helpful 
When I signed up, especially on board on track, it asked me like, the skill set that I have. Yes. So do we do we take a look at that at the overall board to see what the deficiencies are? Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good January idea. retreat. Yeah. I yeah. manage it. Okay. <clears throat> Can I say something more? Sure. I think um, <clears throat> generally there's some PR that could be done too because I think that this group is a mystery to a lot of people and I think that a lot of people's impression is that it's really hard work and it's really constant work and I'm not saying it's not but I'm saying <laughs> that not there at all. in order to I'm not saying it's not that I'm not saying, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not saying in order to attract people there might be ways to make the barrier to entry seem slightly softer if you understand what I'm saying like I just think that to embrace a full community maybe let it be known more what you do like I don't you know have an oral history video up or have a you know shared experience or testimony it's something that just makes it seem like oh yeah I could sync with that group I have that skill I could participate in that way because I think some people just stay away because they're like I don't I'm not meeting for four hours once a month plus a committee plus all this other stuff so just making it more I don't know palatable yeah I mean not that it's not palatable I'm just saying some people stay away if they think that it's really going to be really time-consuming you know yeah. you have three kids in the school and all this other stuff and so I think you know entering through a committee is great um, but I think also just sort of understanding truly what the commitment is but not in a scary way I, I think that's a hundred percent and I think what Bella said is also absolutely correct I have a friend who has attended, I think, a few education committee meetings, not, not when I was there before, I was a faculty representative. Um, but I've had conversations with her, and she said, like, what would make me a good board member? And to be clear, she's <coughs> an excellent board member. She's, like, very conscientious, she's very thoughtful. But I think that that lack of here is what we're looking for can make it a high barrier of entry because there's not something to point to and say, oh, I'm good at that. And I don't think many people have this notion of, oh, I'm a good trustee of an organization. It's a pretty unique feeling to have. I have an observation that's tangentially related to the recruitment of board members, and it speaks to the issue of time commitment. I'm just going to throw this out here. It's not really an action item kind of thing right now. <laughs> but my observation is that there's an inverse correlation between the size of the nonprofit organization and the number of hours its board members spend meeting. So I'm a trustee of a $225 million organization and I spend way less time in meetings for that nonprofit than I do on sweet little old $30 million a year AMSA. And so if we could raise more money, that means <laughs> 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 well, well, I wonder why that is. I'm just throwing it out there. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. I just have one comment to kind of broaden your scope to I know that you're looking at the individual and what they can bring to the table and what your deficiencies are on the committees could you broaden it as to far as who are in our communities that they can bring something in so for example you signed the MOU or something is there anybody at these particular colleges that we can get them a board seat that way it kind of solidifies what we're doing and gives us the, the visibility that you were talking about to kind of get more universities on board with that because then we know we have people out there who are doing kind of the broader mission of what we're trying to pull in. At the same time, we're looking for individuals who can actually do the work based on their skill set. Yeah. That's great. That's a really good reminder of it's not just the person and what they can bring, but what are the connections, right? What are those things? And Marcy talked all the time about connections. Who do you know? What can you bring in? Um, so we'll, I think we need to do it before January, but we'll talk maybe in governance to talk about c compiling that list of what it is that we are looking for, what's needed, what would be aligned with what we're trying to do as a school. Um, we do have more to yes. coming up that has Time in a lot. Yeah. yeah. And um, perhaps if anybody would be interested, I 
would be happy to work with Mr. Finkel on just waiting for his eye contact. <laughs> um, maybe we do some sort of series on social media that really talks about like a bunch of us are willing to go ahead and talk about who we are, what we do, you know, what your particular situation is that you know could be seen as an obstacle for other parents or members of the community and, and why we do what we do. It would be important. We do like um, and we do meet at the first PTO meeting, right? I think maybe the paragraph does it and kind of explains what the board does. Um, and so that is one way to get the word out. I mean, that's kind of how I learned about yep. parents. A so lot of us were parent reps first. Yep. So um, that's one another way to get the word out. And that, and Dwayne mentioned earlier, that that process will start again for the parent rep for next year. This Dwayne's from the other. So I think we can do a, a much better job at marketing yes. us as a board. Okay. Great. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Excellent. Okay, committee reports, development. So, um, development met um, this week, I think it was this week, earlier this week. Uh, to get our bearings on some policies, uh, set some items up for follow-up in October, really get the ground running for this year in terms of getting all of our ducks in a row, um, having conversations about, you know, Mark's already talked a good amount about the 20th year celebration that we're planning for next year, and we're brainstorming ideas left and right about what would be good initiatives to have throughout the year, as well as who to include in those initiatives, and obviously there's plenty of opportunity for uh, partnerships maybe throughout that, especially calling on old contacts, people are affiliated with the school or that wish to be. So uh, more to come on that. Uh, our meeting is on the, I think it's the 16th uh, of October. So we'll look into uh, also communicate with former members, well, former current slash, I guess we'll call them, members of the development committee, see if there's still an interest amongst those and potentially, as we are just talking about, it, recruit more individuals into that committee to provide more insight. That's it from the middle. Anything else that? Great. Um, finance. Um, so the finance committee met, whatever, last week maybe? I can't remember when I got so. Um, uh, so we talked about, you know, what, what was already posted to the agenda for consent agenda, like the construction budget and um, some of the contingency amounts that we have in the construction budget. Uh, everything looks great and um, you know it seems like it, we might be able to do some other things some improvements on the on our facilities with that contingency amount um, Liana and I uh, maybe a month ago met with our investment advisors and they had some suggestions because um, you know a change we made in the past few years is kind of be a little bit more um, focused and planned on our investments and it's really done a good job for us we've able to get a really good yield um, so they had some suggestions we're gonna hold off right now because um, you know some of the suggestions they're making they're making are to tie up our money for three years or five years and we're just not ready to do that right now we need to make sure that we have some liquidity and um, which really speaks to um, our having a capital investment plan which um, we're hoping to get done by the end of the year um, and which is also part, one of our, part of our financial goals. Um, we also talked about our finance, our finance committee goals at length. Um, one of them is really like going through all of our policies that we have as a finance committee. And I don't know if any, all of you on the board trustees you know this, but they're posted in a folder. We added this um, in Board on Track. So if you look in, you know, if you look under the finance committee, there's maybe like. 12, 14 documents that are our policies. So if you ever want, wondered, you know, what a certain policy was, you can go there. Uh, but it's our job to kind of review them and make sure they're up to date, or if we want to edit them. So we're going to do, we're going to tackle two that are kind of important for the next meeting, um, along with all the stuff that's going on for year year end and um, with our auditors that we know is working hard on. Um, and I guess that's it. Good. Um, 
Is there like a 30 second answer to the contingency fund question? Like, as we say, you know, there's money in the contingency fund that we can spend on other things. Yeah. Is there like a quick description of sort of like how that comes to be and how, like how it offsets, like how it can't really be used for other things, but there's certain restrictions on it? Yeah, it's part, you wanted, yeah. So, um, with any contingency money that would be left over after the project, um, there's two options. And luckily, there's two options because of the way that the loan was written. The options would be give the money back to the bank, or the bank is allowing us to spend it on capital improvements on the campus. And again, that's only because of how um, intuitive those were. The folks that were here at the time when they uh, entered that loan agreement with the bank to create of that type of language because otherwise you would have to return the money to the bank. So we can't use it for anything else. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I just think it's always worth clarifying. Yeah. Um, okay. Any questions for Bella for finance? No? All right. Um, governance, Sheila's not here. Did governance meet? No, we canceled. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So next governance meeting will be October 9th. Um, and you know, as we look down to previous meetings, for policy review, I believe that's happening in governance as well, bylaws and policies. So, um, and then for the education committee, um, I did get an email. Christine is unable to be here tonight, but the committee is meeting on Monday the 30th, so they will have a report for the following meeting. Anything else from education? Uh, I think there was a plan to potentially go over the results of the survey from last year because we didn't quite present all of them and we present that at the next board meeting. Okay. Um, I think that's the only thing we'll be meeting about on Monday, but that's part of it. Okay, so we can look for that in October. Okay. Great. Um, so previous meetings, so board policy review that's still ongoing in governance, which has been bumped out to October 9th. Um, for board education, there, um, I don't know if everybody got this link, but there is um, a link where through some of the charter organizations, it's the charter organizations and or board on track, where they have workshops and webinars that we can all participate in. Um, you can sign up and register for them, and if something happens in your schedule, you will get the recording in any materials, so you can watch it at your leisure. Um, so I will send that around. I did get that link, and I. Like I said, I don't know if everybody got that link, so what I'll do is I'll share it via email, and you guys can bookmark it. And I'm gonna try and at least register for every one so that we have the materials, and if I can share them and post them, I'll do that as well. Okay. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah, I got something in my email about something that was happening like on October 25th in Marlboro, uh, and it was the Mass Charter School Association. Yes, they're having their I don't want to call it an annual because they do it like three times a year. Like they are having their convenient convening charter meeting. I think it's right across the street. Yeah, yeah. It's here. Yeah. And it's all day. Yeah. Okay. I'll be there. I can report out. Okay. <laughs> is, that, is that the meeting that got canceled? There was one yes. scheduled for last week, yes. so it has been rescheduled. Oh, uh, yes. okay. All right. Um, I'm not going to lie. It was really nice to get that day back on the calendar. Yeah. <laughs> but what is the date for it? The 25th? Yeah. It was like Friday. Friday the 25th, October 23rd. Okay. All right, we can coordinate that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, and we submitted the enrollment amendment. So mm -hmm. that's check from our last meeting. Any new action items? Yeah. I don't know if this was said earlier. What do we expect to hear on the enrollment? December. Um, that should have been removed because okay. we confirmed we them last week, last month. Yeah. I thought maybe we were becoming more. <laughs> There's nobody else who was willing to jump onto the, <laughs> the committee. <laughs> um, all right, so new action items. I do have Kate Driver talking to her about maybe coming to the board when, she, when things settle down. Would you yeah. take a deep breath? Maybe, maybe after the November 1st, like after yeah. Or the November 1st, 15. So maybe December or if the board meeting is later in November, she would be to do that. Yeah. yeah. Let's work with her schedule. Oh, I don't want to push I her. Do it I'll talk to Kate, the admissions question. Um, any other new action items to put on next month's agenda? 
Excellent. The audit. Thank you, Liana. And is that something that you want to share with us ahead of time or? Yeah. Okay. okay. Anything else? No. Okay, great. I will take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you very much. All those in favor, this is not a roll call vote, right? All those in favor? All those opposed? Excellent. Thank you guys very much. Thank you all for coming.